Okay, when yesterday class we saw that there is a significant, and not significant, but increasingly significant component of power dissipation even in static schema process, which is known as a sub-threshold leakage. And this happens under the conditions that the famous gate, whatever it is, is supposed to be static. That is to say that the inputs are not changing. It doesn't matter whether the inputs are 0, 1, whichever way it is. Either the PMOS or the MOS, one of those should be off. Which means that there can never be a direct path from BGD to ground. What the subthreshold current uh, leakage says is that it's not quite zero current. There is some current, but it's very small. And that current essentially can get multiplied by the large number of transistors in modern circuits and become a fairly significant amount of total leakage if you are not careful in terms of how you design it. Okay? So, first question in that case that comes to us is what can we do to reduce subtraction leakage current? From what you know of the transistor so far, what is the what can you think of that would allow you to reduce the subtraction leakage time? Huh? Right, so the threshold voltage is probably the most important characteristic over there, right? So should you increase it or decrease it? Increase it, right? Increasing threshold voltage will decrease the leakage current. That comes out straight away from that equation, VGS minus VT and so on, right? VGS minus VT. If you increase VT, VGS minus VT becomes even smaller. Therefore, the contribution of the subthreshold current becomes even smaller. Right? Even uh, 100 millivolt increase in threshold voltage can be some two orders of magnitude reduction in the current. What is the problem with increasing the threshold voltage? Why is it that you don't want to increase the threshold voltage on current? Right? So these are conflicting demands. Ideally, you want to have the lowest possible threshold voltage so that you can your transistor for a given size can deliver as much current as possible. Okay? But if you have something of that sort, it's going to leak. So you want to have a high threshold voltage so that the leakage currents are suppressed. Okay? What is very often done in practice, of course it depends on your technology and you need some amount of support from the technology itself for doing this, if you try and have multiple threshold voltages in the same technology. Okay? How do I have multiple threshold voltages? It involves an extra processing step where essentially you know you do some ion implantation or something like that at the gate, right? And bury some charges near the gate. That in turn will directly affect the threshold voltage and can be used to tune it in either direction, either positive or negative. Either you can increase or decrease the threshold voltage by a small amount. Okay? So, having these multiple threshold voltages can be a useful thing to have, but is expensive in terms of technology, it means support from the technology, from the process. Okay. Alright. So, the next component of power dissipation, again, let's just focus on a team of inverter. Consider that the input is changing from 0 to 1, okay? Now this does not happen instantaneously. It's going to take some amount of time, okay? How much is the amount of time that it takes that it is given by the right time of this signal? Right? Typically we would define something like the 10% or 90% right time, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, there is some right time associated with that signal. 
So that's the finite amount of time during which the signal is neither zero nor immediately, but it's slowly transmitted, not slowly. Probably quite quickly because the twice time would typically be in the order of several tens to hundreds of picoseconds. Right? So if it's if the transition is happening within tens of picoseconds, it's not necessarily a slow transition, but on the other hand, it is a finite amount of time during which the signal is neither zero nor zero. Okay? Now, what this means is, normal condition, input is zero, CMOS is on, okay? MOS is off. As the input crosses VT of the NMOS, the NMOS turns on, okay, CMOS is still on, right? <coughs> so the CMOS is still on, it's still conducting, NMOS has just turned on. You go still further and you find that after only after crossing dvd minus dt of the pmos the pmos turns off so during the interval right when vi is between dtn and dvd minus dt both transistors are on. Okay. Now what that means is depending on what the value of the output voltage is at that point, right? There could uh, there may or may not be current flowing through. If the output voltage is either zero or VDD, it means that at least one of the transistors has a VDS equal to zero or close to zero. So that's also good. As long as VDS is zero, it means no current can flow through the transistor. So that's okay. Right? But if VDS is somewhere in between, it means that current can flow through both of these transistors. What does that mean? It means that there is going to be a direct path. Or a short circuit from VDD to ground. Okay. This kind of power dissipation is typically called the direct path power or the short circuit power. And the current that is associated with it is called the direct path current or the short circuit current. Okay. How much is it? It's VDD multiplied by I that is the short circuit current integrated over the entire duration of the transition. Okay, that's the total energy that is dissipated. Okay. The power is that divided by time. So it's essentially you have to give some average power which is essentially that total energy divided by the total time. You can specify that power but the energy itself is the more useful quantity in such a measurement. Right? When you are trying to find out how much is the power you are actually interested in how much is the energy that is dissipated in one transition like this. Okay. The typical nature of that current should be something like this. It's usually called ISC, the short circuit current. It will be zero, then quickly rise up to some peak value then fall away back down to zero. Okay? So because of this shape, and this is common, and even by doing simulations you can find that this is pretty much the shape that it will take. We call this I peak, the peak value of the current. And this duration is called the duration of the short circuit, TFT. Okay. 
which means that one of the things that we can do over here is to sort of approximate this shape as a triangle and say that okay the total energy in that case is just the area under the triangle multiplied by dv okay I take into TXT by 2, half base into head. Okay? So, what this means is, the higher the value of the IC, the higher is going to be the total energy being dissipated, and also the higher the value of TXT, the short circuit duration, that will also increase the amount of total energy, right? But these things can be a bit tricky, it is not very obvious what is it that causes a large value of TSP or large value of IT, right? So one of the things that we can see is as far as TSP is concerned, what do you think, what can you think of as one of the reasons for a large value of TSP? Huh? Slope of its transition, input or output. See, so there are two things over here, right? The input changes like this, the output correspondingly is also false. Right? So now, the main thing that is going to determine your TSC, the short circuit duration, is going to be your input. Because that is what determines when you cross VTN and when you are going to cross VDD minus VTT. Okay? So the short circuit duration is going to be determined largely by your input flow or your input flu rate. Flu rate because essentially what we are saying over there is that is the rate at which the voltage is changing with respect to that. Okay? So that input this is also called the input flu rate or just the input flu. Right? The higher the value of the flu rate, the sharper that transition. Okay? So it's good to have a very sharp transition because your TSP will be reduced. The problem with having very sharp transitions is you will also have other effects like ringing on voltages and things of that sort. Okay? Very sharp transitions in general are sort of difficult for physical systems to manage. There will be some overshoot, undershoot bringing of voltage, all those kinds of other problems will come up over there. Okay? You can try this out in the simulation, five simulations and see what are the effects that actually come up. Okay? So TSC is to a significant extent determined by your input flow. Your IC is determined not just by that. Okay? So it would appear that the IC is just something which is determined by the static characteristic. After all, you say that if I slowly sweep the input, what should be the maximum output current speed? Reality is not so simple. What actually happens is it also depends on the output load. Okay? So if the output load capacitance the output load capacitance is small, how do you expect the output to transition for a given input transition? Do you expect it to be fast or small? Fast, right? So the drop over here will be quite abrupt. Whereas the CL was large, it's going to be slow. Something like this. Okay. Now, what that means is, depending on the actual value of the CL, the amount of time for which the different transistors are going to be on is also going to be significantly different. 
right? For example, the TL last. What happens is you will probably end up going all the way to your PMOS getting cut off before the VDD or VDS on the PMOS has had a chance to change significantly. Okay? So it won't reach the point of being peak current or, or rather of being a very large current. Okay? So ultimately of course it's probably better to do a simulation and to find out under which conditions your peak current arises, but it is affected by the CL as well, the load current, load capacity. Okay? So in other words, what we have is this circular tube current happens during the time that we are undergoing a transition from 0 to VDE. Both CMOS and NMOS are on. There is a direct path current from VDE to ground through both those transistors. It's determined both by IT as well as TSC. The TSC is determined largely by the input flow. And the IT is determined by a combination of the input flow as well as the output output flow, that is to say the output capacitance, which means how quickly is the output going to transition. Okay? So, that brings us to the third and possibly the most important component of the power dissipation. Right? What is normally called the dynamic or switching power. So usually when people talk about dynamic power, this is the one that they mean as far as CMOS circuits are concerned. Okay? So to understand that, let's take a look at the transition in a CMOS inversion. When VI is going from 0 to 1, so rather let's consider the other way around. VO is going from 0 to 1. Okay? What is happening? The equivalent circuit looks something like this. The NMOS transistor is off and therefore just drops out of the picture. The PMOS transistor for all practical purposes has its input grounded. So it's on and it's delivering current into the load. Okay? Over the duration of this entire transition, right, assume that this is the only transition that ever takes place as far as this inverter is concerned. Okay? Initially TL was discharge to 0. At the end of this transition, after sufficient time has passed, TL would have charged up to the Okay? So under those conditions, what is the energy that has been dissipated or rather that has been pulled out of the source, energy from the source? Right? Or the supply. It's going to be given by Huh? Yeah, so VDD times integral of I dt, right? What is I? I can be written basically as it is whatever is the current that is going to be flowing into this capacitance.
we are changing the limits of integration. We are now integrating with respect to dBO. Initial value of BO is 0, final value of BO is dBD. So this becomes equal to CL into dBD square. Right? So what we are saying is that only one transition has taken place so far in the entire circuit. Right? The input went from high to low. The output which was initially discharged to ground gets charged through the pre-mass transistor and goes up to VD. During this transition, this much energy, Cl times VD squared, this much energy is extracted from the source. Okay? Now, at the end of the transition, what is the state that we have? We have one capacitance who is charged up to VVD and no other currents are flowing in the circuit. So there is no more power dissipation. Forget about the threshold and all at this point. Okay? Now, from basic physics again, how much is the energy stored across the capacitor when the voltage across it is VVD? Half C into VVD squared, right? Half CL into VVD squared. So, what we are saying is out of the CL into VVD squared which was pulled out of the supply, half CL into VVD squared is now sitting on the capacitor. What happened to the other half? That has been dissipated as heat in the PMOS transistor. Right? So that essentially was the power loss. It's just like as though you were passing current through a resistor. What happens when you pass current through a resistor? There is some loss of power. Right? I squared R, which essentially we say goes as heat in the resistor. In the same way, the PMOS transistor is not a pure resistance. But still what is happening over here is as a result of the current passing through it, some amount of energy is lost. How much is lost? Half Cl into VDD square. How do we know that? Because the total that was pulled out of the supply was Cl into VDD square. Out of that, Cl in half Cl VDD squared is still available on the capacitor. So the other half has been dissipated. Okay? So now that we have half of it essentially dissipated as heat in the PMOS, what happens during the second part of the transition? That is to say, the next transition as far as that inverter is concerned, this first transition was output going from 0 to 1, which means the next transition has to be output going from 1 to 0. Right? It has to be followed by a 1 to 0 transition. What is the equivalent circuit for that? The NMOS and some current is flowing from the CL into this. Now the interesting thing here is this is not connected to the supply at all. Right? There is no power being drawn from the supply during this case. Okay, or at least not that we can see. Okay. What that means is whatever was stored on the capacitor will be dissipated through the NMOS.
photograph. So, the heart can be destroyed with your sword and the capacity will go through the end mark to the ground and is essentially dissipated as heat. Okay? What it means is during one complete transition, 0 to 1 to 0, right? Energy equal to Cl into Vgd squared is dissipated in the steam of inverter. Okay. This is a very interesting observation. The first thing it tells us is this has nothing to do with the size of the inverter. It is only dependent on the size of the load the load capacitance as such output of the inverter. That of course also has some component to do with the parasitics of the inverter itself. But it's not directly related to the size of the inverter in any way. Okay? This is a very important observation. What it's telling you is that effectively irrespective of the size of the inverter here into VDD squared is the amount of energy that's dissipated per transition. Right? What that means is if you have some frequency of transition, F0 to 1, right? F0 to 1 is the number of times you undergo a 0 to 1 transition per second. Okay? Then the total power is going to be given by F0 to 1 times energy per transition. Which is to say F0 to 1 times Cl times VVD square. Okay? F0 to 1 is sufficient. F1 to 0 is obviously equal to F0 to 1 because every time that you undergo a 0 to 1 transition, 1 to 0 has to follow that. Okay? So, what are the things that we can infer from this? The higher the value of the supply voltage, the higher the value of the power dissipated. Not just higher, it goes quadratically. It goes as the square of Vg. Right? So, if you double the supply voltage, the power dissipation goes up by a factor of 4. Or the converse also holds. If you make the power supply half, your power supply, your power dissipation becomes one fourth. Okay? So this can be a, power, a very effective way of reducing power consumption. If you are able to control your VDD, it means that you can dramatically reduce your power consumption. Okay? The next thing over there is CL. CL is the total load capacitor. Right? This of course I have written for one inverter, but the same thing will hold for a big gate in the circuit. Right? Ultimately we did not even look at the input over here, we only looked at how the output was charging and discharging. Right? And it did not matter whether it was one pull-up transistor, whether it was two pull-up transistors, all we assumed was some current is flowing from supply into the load capacitance, and from the load capacitance through some transistor, it discharges to drop. Okay. So, whatever we derived over here for the case of the inverter, pretty much the same thing is going to hold for any kind of gate. 
which means that for an entire circuit if you look at it what we have over here is the same thing will become right where if i equal 0 to 1 transition on i is also here is low capacitance and i also right which means in turn that the total capacitance that you have in the circuit is going to play a significant part in determining what is the total power being dissipated so the larger the gates that you use maybe the faster your circuit will run because they are greater drive strength but then you have larger capacitance as well right so you are going to end up in a situation where having a larger capacitance is going to end up increasing your power dissipation so ideally you want to use the smallest possible gates for everything the problem is that at some point you might be forced to drive some larger capacitance because you have to interface with some outside world condition there if you have very small gates your delay will become prohibitively large so to interface with those things you have to make some cage in between larger to drive those larger gates you either need to make other gates also larger and so on okay that's where ultimately all your design compromises and design trade offs come f5 the switching frequency ideally i would like from the power point of view i would like fi to be as small as possible okay now is it realistic to make fi arbitrarily small what is the problem with trying to make fi very small ha huh? ha huh? uh no no so there are two things here right this fi is not directly the computational speed of the circuit because the fi is the number of times that that particular gate is undergoing a zero to one transition the circuit as such might be operating at a high frequency all i'm saying is this particular gate should not switch okay so there is a difference over here we'll come to the actual value of f that is the switching frequency of the circuit later once we get to sequential logic but for the time being what we are saying is this is fi the rate at which a particular gate is switching between 0 to 1 okay now making that very low is sort of meaningless because effectively what is saying is if i make that arbitrarily low the calculator saying look that gate was useless if i am able to make it zero for example it means that that gate never switches and in other words it probably uses okay so it's not possible to do that if i am actually having some functionality depending on the functionality that i am trying to implement i am definitely going to have some amount of switching associated with my circuit okay so this fi is something that you can still try to tweak around this in fact there are a number of attempts that you will find if you go look at the literature on power optimization you will find that there are a large number of attempts at estimating and reducing fi okay right? that is to say you try to find out what is the rate at which a particular gate or a particular set of gates is going to switch and see whether there is another architecture or another way of writing the same equation which will reduce that switching frequency okay all right so effectively these three are the three main components as far as power dissipation in schema circuit is concerned the suppressor leakage or the static leakage power the short circuit power which happens during switching and the switching power itself which is directly a consequence of the functionality and depends on the load that is connected apart from these three in static schemas of course you don't have it but in other kinds of mos 
and mass transistor logic for example or pseudo and mass you also have static power dissipation we discussed that when we were talking about pseudo and mass right what is static power dissipation for a pseudo and mass gate what is pseudo and mass so here once again this is remember over here this is a pseudo and mass inverter right when vi is equal to 1 t mass and n mass are both on so that is a short circuit current power is not called the short circuit power as such it is just called the static power for this kind of gate okay normally when we say short circuit current or short circuit power we are talking about the switching during what the short circuit current during switching that we talked about earlier today right this on the other hand is constant once vi is equal to 1 you can leave it like that for a long time and the pmos and nmos are both going to be on and there is going to be a significant amount of current flowing from vdd down to ground is that bad yes but there may be situations in which that is worth while okay you might find that you are the amount of power that you are dissipating is small enough that it is acceptable for your circuit and there are other considerations such as the area or whatever other requirements that you have which are better justified by choosing the pseudo and mass kind of structure okay all right so that brings us to the end of uh, the discussion on the types of power one related thing that is often discussed when we are talking about power and energy is that people then want to find out okay for a given circuit let's say an adder right there are many different ways of building a given adder right we'll see some of those techniques later the question that comes to mind is how do i sort of compare two different adders against each other in terms of their power dissipation or their performance in them okay so one metric which is used in order to sort of compare between different realizations of the same circuit is something called the power delay product so what the case is i have some circuit over here some input some output output it has a propagation delay associated with it and some power dissipation okay i have another circuit has the same propagation delay associated with it and has a different amount of power that is consumed okay one question we would like to answer is which one is better okay now in some cases this may be obvious maybe the first one takes 1 nanosecond propagation delay and has a power dissipation of let's say 1 milliwatt whereas the second one has 5 nanoseconds and 5 milliwatt which one is better the first one right under both conditions propagation delay as well as the power dissipation is better but what if the second one took 5 nanoseconds of propagation delay but only 0.1 milliwatts of power <coughs> then which one would you say is better okay 
So under those conditions, critic thinking might have been is better. Okay? Both have their advantages and disadvantages. One of them is better from a propagation delay point of view, the other one is better from a power point of view. But in order to come up with a direct comparison, this is one metric which is sometimes considered. It's not a uniform metric, it's not something which is some gold standard always, but it's something which is considered a useful way of comparing architecture. Okay? So the power into delay, that product, will essentially tell you, okay, what happens is, one of them is running faster than the other, but consumes lower, or rather one of them runs faster, but consumes more power, right? Whereas the other one is slower, but consumes less power. You can take this product and multiply them, that, and get an estimate of which one is better. Okay? So the power delay product is sometimes, it's usually called the PDT. It's usually considered a metric which is useful for comparing different architectures. Right? One problem with the power delay product is because power is the key V square S kind of structure. If I reduce V, power will come down. Okay. Or yeah, uh, let uh, let me just rewrite that slightly. Consider the highest possible frequency at which a circuit can work. Right? If TC was a propagation delay, implies the highest rate at which it can switch is basically going to be given by S is equal to 1 over 2 times TC. Right? Go once through the circuit, one transition. Go once again, the second transition. Right? So 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. So one full cycle happens within 2 T. Okay, which means that the power delay product becomes equal to C into V square into 1 over 2 T T times T T. Becomes C V square by 2. Okay. This is just a very rough estimate for, let's say, a single day, right? This is more to sort of give a qualitative idea of what is one of the possible problems with the power delay product as a matrix, right? What this means is that the power delay product, as such, if I say that, oh, this has such and such a power delay product, it becomes a bit difficult to actually compare different implementations because I can just lower the operating voltage and get a power, better power delay product. What has happened? My PC has increased or rather my when I lower the operating voltage, my TP will increase. But my S is equal to 1 over 2, 2 TP will decrease and therefore they compensate each other in the PDP. Okay? So, PDP as such because it can be sort of boiled down into something like this and can be manipulated a bit more easily is not always a very great metric. Another alternative is something called the EDP, energy delay product. discussion that we can have as far as the energy dealer product is concerned, but we are out of time. So, I will just finish up with that in the next class and uh, that will finish up our discussion of power as well.